Today I'm going to share with you how I increased my rate of successful hatching using a patented process, as well as my experiences so far incubating in the winter. There is a patent for using hydrogen peroxide as a sterilization agent. And again, I don't normally sterilize eggs, but I have found that this does seem to increase the hatch rate. The patent specifies three to seven percent and you might be thinking, how do you patent something as simple as just applying some diluted hydrogen peroxide onto an eggshell? Well, apparently the process itself is patented. Uh, I use a spray bottle. What I have here is some tap water. So I spray out the tap water. Then I switch this to the hydrogen peroxide. This is something you're supposed to do before you set them in the incubator. And then I'll just spray it with some hydrogen peroxide flip it, spray it again, then I'll spray out everything that was in the tube and I'll stick it back in the tap water and uh, usually my hands will have a little peroxide on them so I'll simply spray them off with tap water. So this has a, a couple different properties apparently. One thing it will do is sterilize the shell itself which you know again should you be doing that well in my experience it's been helpful. Usually my hatch rates are lower. They tend to be around 60, 70%. And since I started doing this process, I've been getting almost 100%. It's just sort of a one-off and I don't get 100% at this point. So I'll spray that, I'll set it right in the incubator. Next day I'll go back and I'll label it with the date. And that's simply because I'm staggering. If I wasn't staggering my hatching, then it wouldn't really matter. So just a note, that is a patent. Somebody has a patent on that process. If you are just a hatcher at home, it probably doesn't really matter. That patent is public information. Anybody can read it. I'll reference it in the description. A couple things about the hydrogen peroxide treatment of eggs that I forgot to mention. There's a theory that the uh, oxygen from it dissolves into it and uh, oxygenates the embryo. It's unclear exactly what the mechanism is, but apparently it adds about 3% compared to atomized formaldehyde, which is a typical treatment of eggs before incubation in uh, commercial hatcheries. Personally, I think it was just some guy who wanted to sterilize the eggs and didn't want to use alcohol and didn't want to deal with formaldehyde and sprayed it with some hydrogen peroxide because it's a pretty good sterilizer and just happenstance that it actually increases the hatch rate. I've been uh, incubating in the winter for a while, which is not something I generally do. When a bulb goes out or something along those lines, it's just game over. You know, you'll lose the birds. And I did have that happen with a couple that were into hypothermia. But I have fresh bulbs and uh, I've been on top of the electronics. I removed a GFCI and switched it out. <clears throat> and I kept all the extension cords out of the rain and that sort of thing that are outside connected to the same circuit and it's been very reliable since. I created these sort of insulated double layer bays that are used as uh, little cabinets for the birds and I also created these fabric covers to help keep the uh, warmth in. I just uh, usually leave a vent open. They're or two vents, I have some foam right here. Those chicks may look the same size, but they're actually staggered by about a week. I'm doing a staggered incubation because my breeding flock was annihilated, other than a handful of birds. So I've been just collecting eggs onesie twosie. And uh, that's okay to do, but it, you know, it's not great for selling. I'm rebuilding my breeding flock again. This is the second time. One day I'll actually be able to sell some chicks again. Anyway, I wanted to just kind of throw in some tips here because I've been getting a very good hatch rate and there are a few factors that account for that. I've also been pretty organized this time around. So occasionally I may have to actually intervene with a chick that's stuck and uh, you know you can see here a little bit of dried blood that chick survived fine on the other hand this chick was stuck and uh, wouldn't come out it had been quite a while 
and it just ended up dying. And one, one thing that was very weird about this chick, it had a bunch of dark blood around it. It had, in the process of pipping, actually pierced a pretty large blood vessel in the membrane. So a lot of blood had leaked out and turned black around it. So it was just sort of a last desperate maneuver to try to save its life, but it doesn't always work, you know? I have uh, helped dozens of chicks out at this point. I, I think I'm actually pretty darn good at it, especially making the call. The hardest part is making the call of when you should intervene. And you can look around, there are dozens of pages and forums about that, you know, making that call. And it just takes experience. I've hatched probably around 100 birds or so. And I've, like I said, probably at least a couple dozen I've saved by intervention. But I've been able to avoid a lot of intervention this time around by doing a few things. Um, one is keeping my humidity level pretty low. I have two separate incubators. One of these is just used for the primary incubation up to about 15 days. And I know that's going to sound a little bit low, but if I wait to 18 days, I find that their pip position isn't great. They lose their orientation. Like, it takes another five days or so for them to regain that orientation, in my experience. You're supposed to be able to do it, you know, pull at 18, give them three days, but I get one pipping at 19 days, one at 20, one at 21, you know, they pip all over the place. Another thing I've been doing is using distilled water to actually spray the walls and the eggshells themselves. I was actually considering even using deionized water for spraying them with because that would help to corrode and erode some of that calcium carbonate in the shell, making it a little bit easier. One thing I noticed is that I've been comparing the process between natural incubation and artificial and the biggest difference I see is uh, the eggs themselves seem to be more pliable and I think it's all the enzymes and oils from the chicken's skin actually getting onto the egg because when I put marker on the eggs, I'll see it eroded and I'll see it lightened a lot. I thought maybe if I was spraying the eggs with something that was at zero parts per million on dissolved ions, it might actually dissolve some of those ions and soften the shell even more. And I can't really say if distilled water is helping in the sense that it's distilled, but it is sterile water for the most part. So that helps uh, prevent any kind of infection because if you just start spraying them with tap water, especially if it's not chlorinated, you could easily infect them with something. Even near the end of the process, I've seen evidence of that. Oh, there we go. If you look carefully, you can see this one moving. Oh wow, I can see its foot moving. This one did not develop. Every once in a while I see this phenomenon. It's sort of like it starts to develop and then something doesn't quite work right. So you can see it looks... Something happened, but it did not work. This one you can see it wasn't even fertilized. So this one didn't even start to develop at all. This one's looking really good. Yep, there it goes, moving around a little bit. My hands are probably a bit cold and it's definitely cold out here. This one is looking good. What is so special about this time and this temperature is that it's uh, really freaking cold for North Carolina. It's about 10 degrees out right now. Let's check this. Oh yeah. See, it was um, around 25 degrees earlier and this pipe was not frozen. But I can, <laughs> I can tell it is frozen now because it makes crunchy sounds. Incubator is doing really well because it's essentially closed. And the chicks are my bigger concern. Let's see what we're at. It was at about 85, so actually we're really close to 90. That is a 70 watt bulb. And we're overcoming, well, about 80 degrees of difference in temperature. I basically wanted to incubate and, 
and have chicks in the middle of winter in a building that has no insulation and full airflow. And it looks like this strategy has pretty much worked. It looks like the heat loss from this incubator is sufficient to uh, actually thaw these two water bottles here. <clears throat> this is at about 50% humidity and it's holding its 100 degree Fahrenheit temperature. But this has a lot more energy going on. This is actually 140 watts. So my process has been putting them into this box here, which is modulated. There's a temperature sensor and it will modulate and always hold it around 90 degrees. Uh, so we've been getting some hot days, for example, where the light really hasn't had to run. And so it will turn off rather than overheating. And then on some colder days, it will be on all the time, etc. As far as treating your water for newly hatched chicks. It's very common to just use some raw apple cider vinegar. And you just put, you know, a cap full, um, probably about per half liter, something like that. Don't put too much, but it's not a big deal if you don't put very much. Uh, I also have some old Gatorade, so I've been adding a little bit of that in. Not a requirement. And I also have some polyvisal, which again is not a requirement. I just happen to have some. So I put a drop of that and a half cap of that and a few grains of that. You know, I'll just throw them in to use it up a little bit. They'll stay in there for 12 to 24 hours and there for up to a week, I'd say. And then I'll move them over and I'll stick them into this. And again, I may put a fabric cover over it depending on how cold it is outside. And, uh, you know, they might be in that for a month or two. And then, believe it or not, after that point, they are outside inside of a poop. You can see right here are a few from a previous batch. And that's a 70 watt light bulb. Then they just have their water and food and they're basically just young adults at that point. I have had issues when you take like some six month old or something, which I'll even say four month. When they're, once they're at four months or so, you stick a one or two month old in there and it's gonna be a problem. So I may end up partitioning this coop in half or something like that to help with that issue. Uh, they also don't have run access right now. There are some boards covering their access to the run so that they have to stay in the upstairs. Once they get old enough, obviously, you can just start ranging them. The biggest problem with ranging is they have to live for a while before they know what to avoid. I don't know exactly how they did it, but this group has avoided foxes, hawks, dogs, whereas I lost 17 birds from those various things. In fact, I've probably lost about 20 birds now because uh, a hawk or something came by. I know a fox has been coming by and nabbing birds here and there. So I'm not really keen on ranging. <laughs> it's something I'm not too pleased about. But uh, you can see here, this is my new system. And I, I think this has actually helped keep some of the animals away even when it starts to get dark out because this, this door doesn't immediately close, but it's such a small opening. I think foxes and such are very leery about going into it. Now, the first time they do go into it and there's no ill effect and they come out with a bird, they'll just start doing it, of course. Links are in the description to everything I've talked about, including the design of the cabinet that I use for incubating and keeping the chicks warm and such. If you found this helpful or enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. Thanks.